here to glorify the Lord. His name is above every name. You can be seated for just a moment. There's one line in that, that song there that always uh, st sticks out to me, and that is, a heart will choose to say. And that is a choice we have, to worship the Lord, to be of a thankful heart, a glad heart, or not. Life is going to throw us all kinds of curveballs and ups and downs. Everybody, it's not unique to anybody. Uh, and, and yet it's the choice of the believer to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus Christ. I'm going to be thankful. I'm going to bless the Lord no matter what happens. And uh, I thank the Lord that we have that choice. It's given to us to choose the Lord, uh, to worship Him in that way, to trust Him in that way. We're going to continue to worship the Lord. And I pray that we really just enter into that place of, of like we're talking about in Sunday School of Thanksgiving and offering up a sacrifice of praise unto our God. He is worthy. Paul says this, and we know that all things work together for good to them that are that love God, to them that are be called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called, and whom he called, then he also justified, and whom he justified, then he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right gift of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors to him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, or things present, or things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And God, I thank you. There's nothing in this world that can separate us from you, God. But Lord, you require our heart, God. You require surrender. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here this morning, God, that's not surrendered fully, God, Maybe they stray from you, Lord. I pray this morning they be right with you, Lord. I pray, God, the devil doesn't put any lies and it's too late. It's been too long. I pray, God, today would be the day of salvation. Today would be the day they would be reconciled. God, I thank you for these promises in your word. God, your word washes our hearts and strengthens us, God. It encourages us, Lord. And I just pray. Help us to worship you this morning, God. I pray we commune with you this morning, God. I pray that you speak to our hearts. I pray that you open blind eyes, Lord, and soften our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
John chapter 11, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead who had been dead for uh, four days and in the grave. When we come to this, it's getting uh, close to the, the crucifixion. Jesus is making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem where he's going to be crucified a short time later. And it's getting close to the time of the Passover and the people are making their way to Jerusalem for the feast. Of the Passover. I want you to read in John chapter 12. We're going to read verses 20 and 21. And really, uh, verse 21 will be our, our text for the day. John 12, 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. We would see Jesus. That is still the greatest need of men today. That men see Jesus Christ. And we come to know him. When Jesus, uh, in John 14, a few chapters later, is talking with the disciples, and he said he's going to prepare a place for them and, and come again and receive them to himself. And, and Philip said, Jesus, show us the, the Father, and it sufficeth us, and it's sufficient for us. And Jesus said, Philip, have I been so long time with you now, and still thou hast not known me? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And so it is still the greatest need of men to see Jesus Christ. And they came seeking the Lord, and they wanted to find him, maybe out of curiosity, maybe out of genuine desire to worship, but they came. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, when, when you don't need to turn there, but when speaking about the, the gifts of the Spirit and how they are to work and operate within the church setting and corporate worship setting, it talks about the, the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts, the gifts that are manifest in the life of the believer. It says an unbeliever comes in and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a 
truth. Praise God that, that the Lord is in us and people can see Christ in us. But these men came, desired to see, to see Jesus, these Greeks. It says two uh, certain Greeks, and, the, and what they were, they were, they were not Hebrews, they were Gentiles, but they were Jewish uh, proselytes. They had become converted to the religion of Judaism, though they weren't Hebrews by birth. And they were in Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And just prior to this, as I said, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. This was a notable miracle. And they were close to the, the town where they were passing through on the way to Jerusalem was close to uh, where, where Lazarus had been raised from the dead. And these men came desiring to see this miracle work that they heard. People were actually testifying. There were people that were eyewitnesses to Lazarus's resurrection, and they were telling everybody about Lazarus, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. A lot of people came to see Lazarus, okay, and say, "Wow, you're the one he raised from the dead." Yep, it was me. I was dead, and there were eyewitnesses there uh, that saw the whole thing, and they were testifying of it. And now these men, these Greek converts to Judaism going to Jerusalem to worship for the feast of the Passover where Jesus was headed himself to be the Lamb of God they said we Philip knew he was one of his disciples sir we would see Jesus we desire to see Jesus and I think what greater sight could we behold what greater more glorious sight could a man see or desire to see than Christ Sirs, we would see Jesus and everything else kind of fails in comparison, doesn't it? Everything else just fades away. Everything else that we pursue after life comes to nothing. I want to see the Lord. I want to see Jesus. I want to see Christ. I want to see him seated, seated on his throne. I want to see him high and exalted, lifted up. I want to see that. I want to see that by faith. We can see in that way. One day, look, our faith will end in sight, and we will actually see the Lord. I have a question for you and for myself. These men came desiring to see Christ. They asked of Philip, and of course he brought them. But is, is my desire, this is the question, for Christ greater than all other desires? Or would I rather see or have or hold something else more? Is my desire for Christ greater? Or is the other things that in reality, if I was to be honest with myself, I would rather have this more. I would rather see this more. I would rather partake of this more. These eyewitnesses have been testifying of God's power to raise the dead. And then Lazarus was there, and the witnesses were there. But these men had the right idea. We, we want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. And if you and I are his followers, as his followers, the redeemed of the Lord, those of us that have by faith seen Jesus Christ, we're his ambassadors. And if we would testify like these were testifying of the miracle, we didn't have time to read it all for this chapter. So they were telling people, Jesus raised Lazarus, this man, from the dead. And people came to see. And many believed. Hallelujah, we need some rain. Uh, many, many believed uh, on the Lord and came seeking the Lord because of their testimony. And I thought, you know, if we would testify as his followers, if we would live in such a way and testify of what the Lord has done for us and the new life he's given us and how he's totally changed our lives and brought us out of a horrible pit, set our feet upon a rock and established our goings. If we would live in such a way to give God the glory, I believe that men would come to us desiring to see Jesus. I don't think there's enough testifying. Testifying through life and words, both. Through the way we live a holy life separated unto God in all circumstances, in all areas, at all times, and the way we testify with our mouths, giving God the glory, if we would live such, in such a way as that, and, and in the spirit, the Bible says, if we live in the spirit, let us walk in the spirit, okay? And if we would open our mouths and testify of all that Jesus has done for us, all he brought us out of, can you just sit for a moment and think, 
Maybe you were saved as a child and God spared you from a life of worldliness and sin. Okay, but maybe you've been saved later in life like me and we can think of what God brought us out of to where we are today. Not an arrogance, it's a, it's a joyfulness, it's a thanksgiving of where I was and where the Lord has brought me. And if we would testify and tell others if I would be more bold in my lifestyle, living for Christ and testifying, as these men said, he raised this man from the dead. Really? So there's the, the ones testifying, then they went to see the one that was healed. Then these, these Greeks said, we want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. I believe that would be the, the case in our life. The new life that he's given us, men would come desiring to see the Lord. How many of you know it's not enough that they see the Lazarus? They need to see the one who raises the dead. But Lazarus, you were raised from the dead. That's, that's almost like a, in a worldly sense, almost like a freak show, show like a sideshow. Oh, really? He, did, he walked on water? You know, you walked on water too? Uh, it's not enough for them to see the one who was raised from the dead. Men need to see the one who can raise the dead. They got to come all the way. All the way. And through seeing us, I pray that they would be brought all the way. The Bible says in 1 Peter, for you are a chosen generation. If you're born again, as every Christian, whether you're newly saved or not, you, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, all of those things, simply by being in Christ, for a reason that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We, have, we are saved not only for our own salvation, the love of God, praise God, to bring us to heaven one day, we are saved to show forth the praises of him, him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We ought to be able to testify, we should be testifying. Men don't need to see simply to see you and me. They do need to see us, but they need to see us because of Christ in us. Men don't need to see simply you and me. They need to see Christ who saved us. They need to see Christ in us. I'll say this, when you preach, those that do preach in this pulpit, and I thank God for them, when you teach Sunday school or teach the kids or you, you, lead, you lead youth on Friday nights, or you sing up here on this platform, or you witness to somebody or work or go to school, or you open in prayer like we do on Sunday night. Someone comes up because they've been asked to open in prayer up here. People must see the Lord. They must see the Lord, not you or me. Of course they see us physically and they know us and so forth, but they must see the Lord in us. There was a young pastor who took over a new church and uh, it was fresh and new. They had ordained, uh, called him to be their pastor. And he was young and younger than most of the people. And he was in a real urban and suburban kind of church. And their people were educated. And there was a college town. And people were very educated. And he started preaching. He said, certainly these people want, uh, they want very intellectual sermons and messages. So he would prepare very intellectual messages. And he preached and teached, and the crowd started dwindling, and the young people started drifting off, and there weren't so many people in church, and the young couples started drifting off. And he couldn't figure out what was going on. After several weeks or several months, uh, someone came, came and handed him a piece of paper, folded together, and left, and he opened up the note, and it said, we would see Jesus. That's what we want. That's what we need. We need to see the Lord. There's enough other stuff going on. In the name of the Lord, I've probably been guilty of it myself, but men need to see Christ. If he's lifted up, he'll draw all men unto himself. These, these Greeks that were seeking Jesus, that came to Philip in, in John 12, they could actually go to the Lord. They could physically see him. They could see the word made, made flesh. But he's risen now. He, crucified, buried, rose the third day and has ascended. 
We can see him by faith. One day we will see him. The Bible says every eye shall see him one day. We're going to see him as he is. We're going to see him in his glory. And I thank God for that. But we still see him today as his people and then see him by faith. That's how you see the Lord. When you talk about seeing Jesus, we see him by faith. Our faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things what? Not seen. We don't physically see, but we see in our hearts. We can see the Lord. We can see him. He is found of those that seek him with their whole hearts. He was still today found. These Greeks came seeking Jesus. Okay, they went through the proper channels and so forth. And he is still found of those that seek him. He is seen by faith. And guess what? He's seen in and through his people that he has redeemed. He is seen in people. We're a peculiar people, right? Uh, chosen generation, a holy uh, nation and priesthood and so forth. But he's seen in those that he has redeemed. He's seen specifically, you could say, in his church. He reveals himself and shows himself through the lives that he has redeemed. That as believers now, we are the dwelling place of God. So just think about it. What is what has the Lord left on this earth? If he was only here for 33 and a half years, and the whole history of humankind, that Jesus was only on the earth in that fleshly body for a very short time, and 30 years of that he lived in obscurity. Three and a half years was his public ministry. How was God seen? What would you say is seen in creation? The Bible tells that, tells us that. He's seen in the Holy Spirit. Um, brings that conviction of men's heart of the reality of God, of sin and of righteousness of judgment. He's seen and comes to reveal himself by the word of God. But really that vessel that he's left is the church. I say left, not the sense of he left or abandoned us. He placed us here. Those that he has saved and called together. We are to represent him. We are the body of Christ. Our, your physical, literal body if you're saved, is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And this, we're taught that very clearly in 1 Corinthians 6. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, you're not of your own? Therefore glorify God in your body. Glorify the Lord in your body. He is seen in his people, and he's seen collectively in the church. He is seen through vessels of clay. Just vessels of clay. Nothing special. The Lord, though, chooses to reveal himself, speak to men by his, his church body. He's chosen to dwell among his people. I'll just read this from, from John 14. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. It's an amazing thing. I don't know if some other religion, I don't know if Allah is said to live in his people and so forth. I'm simply saying it's an amazing thing. If a man loves me, he'll keep my commandments and my father will love him and we will come and make our dwelling place with him. So when people see you and they see me, they need to see the Lord. Of course they know us and our names and male and female and our age. They know about us. But they need to see Christ in us because he has chosen to reveal himself through his people. He comes and makes his dwelling place and he shows himself through our lives. Like I preached last week, if we'll let him. If we'll let him. Preach last week, God can do anything if we'll let him. God can do anything through our lives if we'll let him. If we'll believe him for that and trust him and walk in his ways. He manifests himself through his people, through his church body. I just wanted to read this from Ephesians 1. And that put all things under his, his feet, under Christ's feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So he shows himself. It is important how you live and how I live. It is important. We just go through this life and we tell very few people about Jesus. One day we're going to die. We're going to face the Lord. And 
is we're saved, we're saved, like we talked about in Sunday school. That's not going to, we're, we're robed in the blood, uh, uh, the righteousness of Christ and washed in his blood. But we'll get to heaven and say, I, uh, Lord, I'm sorry. What can you say? I told very, very, very few people about you. I took my light and I hid it for the most part under a bushel. I had some highlights where I told a few people, maybe got to pray with somebody for salvation. But the Bible says that we're, we're vessels. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The treasure is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He has chosen to reveal himself, yes, through creation and through his word, but we are living, breathing examples of what the Lord can do in a life. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like uh, the redeemed of the Lord to testify of what the Lord has done. We're his ambassadors, his instruments of righteousness. We're vessels of honor. And I said we're living, breathing examples of the salvation of Christ. You know, a scientist, or so, let's say the astronauts go to the, the moon, they went to the moon. They brought back some things, didn't they, right? Some dust. And they brought back some moon rocks or whatever. Or somebody travels to a foreign land or to the bottom of the sea where nobody's been. They want to bring a specimen. Okay? Scientific. I don't want to bring it This is a specimen of the type of sea creature that lives down there. Here's an actual specimen, right? And in a weird way, not trying to be too weird, we are the specimen of what the Lord can do in a life and desires to do in a life. We're that one. People hear about Christ and Christianity and Jesus and the blood. They hear about all those things all their lives. But you and I are to be that live and breathe and I am one. Here's one, right? Here's one. Here's a Christian. We tell other people about Jesus. And we live in such a way that you can see Christ in us. We're not perfect like he is perfect, but I want to live in a way that men can see Christ in me. He's given the church to be that representative of his on the earth, his ambassador. By the power of the Holy Ghost, you are his hands and his feet and his voice. He's chosen for us to represent him to men. Lost men and saved men ought to see the Lord in us. Believers ought to see the Lord in us and lost people. A lot of people are uninterested. We can't, that's really not my concern, so to speak. Some people could care less. They're not interested in Christ, Christianity, what the Lord has done in your life. It doesn't matter. But it matters to the Lord. That you testify to him. So that men are without excuse. Men are without excuse. It would be a shame for somebody to be in your family or in your office and die and go to hell and say, I never saw a real Christian in my life. I didn't know if I really believed at all. Thought they were all a bunch of hypocrites, right? Die and go to hell because they didn't see a good example where that specimen, so to speak. And if we're going to represent him, we need to represent him rightly. I need to represent him rightly. Not some, my take on Christianity or some perverted form of Christianity. Like Buck was sharing in, in Sunday school, there was a man that was a real life example of a man that was committing adultery. And he had a Christian tell him that was okay, that's all under the blood. It's not, that's a perverted I'm not saying that, that God can't repent and be forgiven and be cleansed and it be under the blood, yes, but just to say that's already under the blood, that's okay. It's a perverted representation of Christ. He says, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, how can I do that? Only by Christ in me. Only by the Holy Spirit living inside of me. Can I be there? We need to represent him rightly and not some a take on our, of our, our Christianity. Like I read that scripture, a lost man comes in, they see, they see how God is in the midst of his people in a church service, and they fall on their face and worship God and say of a truth, God is in you. A 
false man. That's what he's talking about. John in the first Corinthians 14 comes in and says that. The Bible says in John the Beloved Christ in 1 John 4, he says, For as he is, as he is right now, so are we in this world. Just think about it for a second. As he is, so are we in this world. That Christ is in us. In, in order for men, I want to bring this on more to, to our testimony from the Lord. In order for men to actually see the Lord in us, which they are to see the Lord in us, in order for that to happen, you and I must see him ourselves. And what I mean by that, you and I must stand in his presence like Elijah did. Whether he was by a brook, uh, uh, the brook, or whether he's with the widow woman, or whether he's with King Ahab, he said, I'm the Lord in whose presence I stand continually. Are you the one that's troubling Israel? Is what Ahab said to him. He knew he was a man of God. There was no doubt about it. This man is a man of God. He knows him. In order for us to represent the Lord like that, we have to see the Lord ourselves. You need to live in such a way by faith that you're communing with God. That's what I'm talking about. Living in His presence. Living in His presence. And are changed in that sense. Fellowship with God. Communion with the Lord. To live in His presence. To walk in the light as He is in the light. We must see Jesus ourselves regularly on a regular basis that others may see Jesus in us. We have that responsibility. It's a responsibility. It's also a greatest, greatest privilege known to man to have communion with Almighty God. But we have that. We must not grieve the Holy Spirit. We must not quench the Holy Spirit. We must be filled with the Holy Ghost because the Bible says the Holy Spirit is the one who makes Christ known. You, can, you and I can physically in our humanity tell people the gospel and quote scriptures and that's good to do. We should do that. Not in our humanity though. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that takes Christ and puts him on his throne. That takes Christ and reveals him to men as the risen Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit does that. He will teach you all things, Jesus said, and bring to remembrance all things that I have told you. He won't speak of himself. He will speak of me and testify of me and glorify me, Jesus said, the Holy Ghost, when he comes. And so we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to behold the Lord, to behold his face by faith in order to show forth his praises to others. Moses' face shone or shined with the glory of the Lord, showed forth the glory of the Lord when he came down off the mountain. How and why did his face shine like that? Not just because he wanted it to. He didn't even realize that it did, that it was shining that way. He didn't even know it. But for 40 days and 40 nights, he was beholding the Lord, so to speak. He was with God. He was communing with Almighty God without an intercessor between the two, him and the Lord. And the Lord allowed him to see uh, the back, his backside as he passed by. But the point is, he had tarried in the presence of Almighty God. And it affected him. Even unbeknownst to him, it affected him and his countenance and his demeanor. And his life was shining with not just a good suntan, his life was shining with the Shekinah glory of the Lord. It was just a reflection. He wasn't the source of it, but it was a reflection from his life because he had been in the presence of God. And there was no doubt. Some people liked it, liked it, disliked it. That's not the point. The point was they knew he had been with the Lord. It says of Peter and John, when they were arrested for healing the, the, the preaching the gospel, and the lame man was with them that had been healed, Right? Silver and gold have we done? But they, they healed the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. He was leaping and praising God. 
and they, they didn't like this because they preached the gospel and 5,000 people got saved and the Jewish council called them down on it. That when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, that's what they perceived about them naturally. They're unlearned, listen to them talk, and they're ignorant. These are fishermen. Their hands, they've been towing fishing lines off and nets all their lives. They're ignorant and unlearned. It says they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They took knowledge. These are unbelievers and were rebellious and had no desire to believe. They weren't seeking Jesus like the Greeks that were going to worship the Passover. But they took knowledge that these men had been with Jesus Christ. They cannot, must not, go out, so to speak. Go out into your workplace and your school and so forth. Go out into life unprepared. I would say empty, dry, stale, fleshly. But we can't go out without have, having been in the presence of God. We are his ambassadors. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to learn what it means to tarry before the Lord. When you say I'm too busy, then God, God's going to slow you down. You ask him to. He's going to slow you down, put you in a sick bed if he has to, till we learn how to tarry before the Lord. It is a must. It's not a luxury. I oh, wish I was a kind of Christian just pray and read all day. It must be wonderful. Well, we may not be able to pray and read all day, but we can pray and read more than we do. And we can learn what it is to tarry in the presence of God. We have need of it. It's not, it's not a, a luxury. It's not a luxury. It is a necessity to continually abide in Christ, commune with the Lord. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. We need to meet with him. We need to hear from him. We need to be cleansed by him. We need to be forgiven by him. We need to be led by him. We need to be taught by him. We need to be filled with his Holy Spirit that others may see the Lord in us. Even if you have a great burden for souls to be saved or a revival in our country, and I pray you do have that. I'm praying that as well. Even with the great burden, if we're not much with Christ personally, on our own, and our own commune with the Lord, they're not going to see the Lord in us. We need that testimony from the Lord. And it's not a cheap way to get it. It's not a shortcut. It's not a crash course on how to do real estate, make a million dollars by the end of the year. This is coming to know Christ. Personally, and it takes time. He's the potter with the clay. I need to sit up on that potter's wheel and let him mold me and make me. And I need to do it in prayer. And I need to do it at these altars. And I need to do it at my altar at home. And I need to do it with the Bible open in front of me, reading his word and seeking his face and listening. And listening to what he has to say to me. And saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Not my will, but thy will be done. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John, chapter 3. No, I'm sorry, 1 John, chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. Here's John the Beloved, who is, of all the human beings on this planet, all of his disciples, he loved them all, and they were close to him all. John the Beloved was the one that communed with him more so as I believe he belongs from the Lord more than the, than the others. 1 John 1 1. That which, we, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested. This is Christ in the flesh, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you. So he said, because of that life that we saw, that we handled, and touched, and, and saw, and heard with our own ears, that's the life that we're showing to you. We're bearing witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship was with, is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Again, what is John saying? We saw him. 
We saw him. We heard him. We touched him. And that's the same life that we're showing unto you. I just thought about how that testimony for Christ, I know that he walked physically with him, but we have the Holy Spirit within us. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We can tell men all the time, we can tell men all about the Lord, and we should do that, but they must see the reality of the Lord in us. Amen? He is the hope of glory. He is the hope of all men. We need to show forth what he can do in a life. How he can transform a life. How he can form, conform a life to the image of his son. And testify, I'm not the man. The man you see standing before you is not the man that I once was. Now some people know us well. And they know good and well we're not the same person. And we can tell them. And others might not know. But just like Lazarus was raised from the dead, we need to testify how he gave us eternal life. Amen. But we've got to come into his presence and we need to be changed by the Lord ourselves. We have to be. We have to be. It's not some secret mystical thing. It's simply abiding in Christ like those who get up on the mountain. It's time in his word and time in prayer. And, and the Lord is able to, to make us more like Christ in every way. Let's be filled with his life. The life of our Savior, amen? That it be evident to others. That's the way he desires to do it. And the Bible says that, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into that same image, even by the Spirit of the Lord. We all with open face, beholding as in a mirror, it's reflected the glory of the Lord, are changed into that same image. You want to become more like Christ? Do I want to become more like Christ? I do. The, the, the way to do that is to come into His presence. Come into His presence. I'm not talking about lighting a bunch of candles and getting the room dark and wait until your hair on the back of your neck stands up. I'm talking about coming into the presence of God in prayer and in communion and with His body when we gather and by yourself in your bedroom or walking around your living room and open up the Bible and say, reading, uh, blessed the undefiled that walk in the way. Lord, help me to be undefiled and walk in your way. And you start reading the Bible and you go through it and you know that you're in the presence with God, of God and we are being changed. Amen? We're being changed. I'm going to bring this on to a close. You and I, as, as Christians that do know the Lord, we have great need to see the Lord ourselves for our own strength, personal growth in Christ, and for the glory of God on the earth. Again, he could have just raptured us, but he didn't rapture us yet. He could have called us home as soon as we got saved, but he didn't call us home as soon as we got saved. We're left here, we left his church here to be ambassadors. They need to hear more than our doctrinal statements, although they need to hear doctrine. They need to see Christ in us. They need to see the Lord. And you and I as Christians need to see him to, so that men will see the Lord in us. We need to see him when we're burdened with sin. We need to see him. Why don't we go to him and be cleansed and forgiven and confess? We need to see the Lord when we come to worship, like on a Sunday morning or when Wednesday night at the times we gather to worship or maybe you're just worshiping in your home. We need to see the Lord when we come to worship. We need to see the Lord when we go to prayer. We need to see the Lord when we open his word and read it. We need to see the Lord when we come to church. Sir, we would see Jesus. Desire to see the Lord. Don't be content to come and go and move on without knowing that you have communed with the Lord. I think we're too quick to be content. It was a good service. That was good, that really good little word food for thought or whatever it may be we are not to settle for that i am not to settle for that don't be content to come and go and not be changed don't be content to come and go not having genuinely in your heart of hearts communed with the lord it's almost like we should insist upon it i think we can 
The Bible says that Jesus, uh, the Lord says in Hebrews that, uh, that we must believe without faith it's impossible to please him, right? He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. I always say, what is the reward that he gives to those that diligently seek him? The plain and simply it's himself. He's a rewarder of those who are seeking him. I'm seeking God. It wouldn't be a reward if he gave me something besides Christ. If I'm seeking Christ, the reward is Christ. And to come into his presence and know that we've been in his presence. Just insist upon it. Make it a conscious thought. Lord, I want to meet with you today. Might be the last day we have, right? Might not be. Might have many more days, but every day, insist upon seeing the Lord, not by necessarily by a feeling, but by faith. One day we're going to see him, as I said, high and lifted up in all his beauty and glory with unveiled face. We'll see him. What a day that, that would be. But I pray until that day that others would truly see the Lord in me consistently. I want my life and my words and my love and my conduct to display Christ. Not my version of Christ, but Christ. The biblical Jesus that we read about, the actual Christ. For the glory of God, to show forth what he can do in the light. There's enough of people seeing the false, they need to see the real. They need to see the real. I'm going to close with this. Uh, Philip, you know, Philip was not one of the 12 disciples, not the Philip that's in, mentioned in the book of Acts. He was an evangelist. He went down to Samaria. He was a layman. He was one of those that was ordained to, to minister to people and, and, and serve the widows and so forth in the early church. But he was filled with faith and wisdom in the Holy Ghost. And he, he went to Samaria and he preached Christ to them. And the Bible says that the people gave heed to the things with one accord, they gave heed unto those things which Philip spake. Why did they listen and give heed and actually believe what he said? Just words, right? It says they gave heed to what he spake, hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. And there was great joy in that city. What am I saying simply? He was a walking, breathing, living testimony of what he was talking about. He was an example a specimen, okay, of what he preached and taught to others. He was that. You know the story of Ruth and Naomi, right? With her mother-in-law, when Naomi's two sons died, and one of those was Ruth's husband, and they were away, and they were going back to Israel because now the famine's over and they're gone home. And Naomi says, Ruth, go back to your, your gods and your people and your home and your family. And Ruth says, Entreat me not to leave thee or return from following thee after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go where thou lodge, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and my, thy God, my God. You know what I think about that? A lot of things I think about that. But you have to say without question that Ruth saw the Lord on Naomi's life. And all the things that can be added to that sermon or lesson you would have to say Ruth saw a reality of Jehovah upon Naomi's life to where she says, I'm going with you. She goes on to say, where you die, I'm going to die. Where you're buried, I'm going to be buried. Nothing's going to separate me from you. Your God is going to be my God. She had to have seen the Lord. She had to see the Lord displayed through, through Naomi's life. Then you can come on up, but there was... A lecturer, Christian lecturer, or at least he was asked to lecture at a big conference in a third world country. And these are like these are like farmers and, and maybe blue collar workers and plumbers and, and you know just blue collars. And this is a real educated person who's asked to give a lecture to them. And the lecture was about knowing God. And when the, when the lecture was over, he gave all the Greek 
and the Hebrew definitions of knowing and so forth. The lecture was about knowing God. And one of the carpenters came up to him afterwards who had listened and, and said, excuse me, sir, I have a question for you. He said, sure, what is it? He says, have you met Jesus yourself? I don't care how smart people are. People need to see the Lord. They need to see the Lord. Hey, have you met the Lord? Have you seen him yourself? Do you know him? I don't know if he was being smart like that. I think he was generally wanting to know. Yes, yes, yes. I know him. I've seen him. He's good. He's here. He wants to save you. Let me tell you more about him. Y'all stand with me. Seeing, seeing, seeing Jesus is fundamental to genuine Christianity. And genuine Christianity is really the only Christianity. It's fundamental. Some men walk away and it's because they never did see the Lord. They joined the church, they joined the movement, but they never actually saw the Lord themselves. Isaiah said, the year the king is I saw the Lord. I saw him. I lifted up. He was seated upon the throne, and his train filled the temple. I want to see the Lord, and by faith we can. Just encourage you, live in such a way where literally you don't just come to church and read your Bible and come back tonight to church, but make a, a determination, God, I want to see you. I need to see you. I want my face to shine like Philip's did when he was, uh, Stephen's did when he was being stoned for his, his sermon that he preached. And Moses did when he came down off the mountain. I want my life to, to bring God glory. And in order for that to happen, I need to commune with him. Sir, we would see Jesus. Father, I pray, God, that we would live in such a way that men literally ask, tell me what's the reason, what's What's the reason you have this hope in you? And we would humbly be able to say, Christ changed my life. He's real. He lives inside of me. Can I tell you about it? God, help us, Lord. Teach us, Lord, to tarry. Teach us, Lord, when we pray to really pray. Teach us when we read our Bibles to really be instructed by you. Teach us, God, to commune with you and help us. Help us, Lord. We need help to do it. And change us and let our life show forth the glory.